my um, house here, I'm proud to boast that I'm the seventh generation to live here. It was built by um, Erastus Allen, uh, who came to town as an orphan with Gerald, Jared Skinner of the Skinner Burn property. And um, Erastus married um, Paulina Wilder um, from just across the uh, river here, the Wilder Farm. And uh, her mother was uh, Elizabeth Barnard Palmer. And when they got married, uh, her father, Daniel Wilder, deeded them this land on this side of the river. And they came here and they set up and built a modest house. This house that I live in has been modified at least, added on to at least four times that I know of. So the original house is directly behind me, but uh, they raised the roof once and added another story and went in two directions and added on. But it was right here is where they settled in. They, uh, I think they had a little bit of wanderlust because they couldn't stay here. So they sold the uh, place here to uh, Paulina's cousin, uh, Linus Barnard. Um, and they moved to, on to North uh, Faston and off to Governor New York. And why anybody would move to Governor New York in those days was beyond me, when they had beautiful bottom land right here, but that they did. Uh, Linus Barnard, uh, father was Sam, and their farm is where George Carpenter is right now. So Linus just had to move down the road here a mile, and he set up farming here. And of course, in those days, it was pretty much subsistence farming. Uh, there wasn't that many cash crops. Um, we're talking, this house was built in 1812. So, you know, 1820, this is still pretty much wilderness around here. Um, so Linus set up farming and he passed it to his son, Don, Don Carlos Barnard. And, uh, the farm grew, and Don Carlos built this big barn over here in 1888. And by that time, farming was uh, um, a lot of um, dairy products, not so much fluid milk, but they would process it into uh, cheese and butter, and that they could ship out. So. Don Carlos um, built that barn and 10 years later he died. And he left without a son. So the um, daughter, Jenny Barnard Palmer, received the farm. She had married um, Fred R. Palmer. Fred R. Palmer. And they were set up housekeeping and farming where the 1824 house is now. And that was sort of a small farm, not much to it. The barn which you see there today is pretty much the barn they had back there in um, about 1890, uh, 1898. So beautiful big barn here, beautiful land. It was a real opportunity. So Fred and uh, Jenny moved over here and took up farming. So hence my name changed, family name changed from Barnard to Palmer. Um, there's a picture that shows the generation sitting, standing over here on the porch. And from left to right is Jenny Barnard Palmer. There's a little girl standing up next to her, and that's my great aunt. Uh, Gladys Palmer Gaylord. There's an older lady sitting in the background, and that's Melissa Wheeler Barnard, um, Don Carlos Barnard's wife. And uh, my daughter is named after Melissa. And then the little boy that's sitting there on the porch is my grandfather, uh, Harry Palmer. And the gentleman standing here on the uh, 
dooryard holding on to his horse and had to be his favorite horse, being the picture with the horse, not his wife, is uh, Fred Palmer, Fred R. Palmer, and his favorite yoke of oxen standing in the background there. Um, so I'm quite proud of that picture showing the various generations. And uh, <laughs> the idea that my grandfather is just a little boy sitting here on the porch. Um, Fred Palmer was um, really quite the entrepreneur. He really developed this farm uh, quite well. It was very well spoken of in the whole county. He um, had his um, Guernseys. Most of them were registered. And like I just said, they um, couldn't sell fluid milk at that time because there was no refrigeration. They couldn't move it. But he'd sell the cream. And the cream, he would take over to where Dave Hartsohn has his uh, vegetable stand. There used to be a creamery right there. He used to take it over there and it was processed. Um, the skim milk, Fred would take and uh, feed hogs. He'd feed them all summer long and fatten them up and everything. And then come, uh, come fall, he would uh, slaughter them. My aunt. Gladys talks about that event every year and how she didn't mind helping after the hogs were killed because they squealed terribly, she said, when they were killed. And he would, um, they'd wait till cold weather uh, to do this and they'd slaughter them one day and have them and he'd put them on his big lumber wagon he had and by horses, he went down the middle six to meet, meet the uh, ice train that he would load them onto, and they would take them down to Boston and were sold. So he had cream, he had milk, uh, he had um, hogs. He did a lot of sugaring. He sugared both ridges here. Uh, the ridge over here is Mount Waitsfield, and he sugared there and also up behind the Wilder farm. Um, he had owned property up there, and there was also some relative property sugared there. And there wasn't much m of a market for uh, syrup in those days, but there was a huge market for sugar. So he would boil all of his uh, syrup down to sugar and put them in wooden, wooden um, buckets that were made right here in Waitsfield, um, right by where Reggie Orr has his little shop there. Um, there used to be uh, a little bit of a mill right there and a Cooper Smith shop. And, uh, and now when you go by, they get some sort of little windmill with a water wheel and everything turning. Or if you look real closely right there, you'll see a foundation out there on the rocks, and that's where they had the Cooper Smith shop to build these wooden tubs that Fred would put his syrup in. And uh, they would uh, stencil the names on the buckets and send them west, and, uh, which was just east of the Mississippi at that time. Um, and most of the clients were uh, family members or extended family. And one particular year, Jenny put a little swatch, swatch of cloth attached to each tub of sugar with the uh, instructions to sign their name, date it, and where they're from and send it back to them, back to her, which she did. And then she and Melissa built a uh, beautiful big quilt, built a beautiful big quilt with all of these pieces of cloth in it. And it's always been referred to as Fred's quilt and it's right, I have it right here. It's in the parlor now. And uh, uh, it's been written up as with a lot of other quilts from Vermont. And it has been to Paducah, Kentucky several times where they have a big quilting fest down there. Um, my um, Grandfather farmed here for a brief period of time during the Depression and had a large family, and it was hard times. Um, 
The only thing that kept them from starving was the main fact that they could grow most of their food. But my grandfather didn't care for farming, and neither did the oldest son, my uh, Uncle Corliss. He didn't care for farming. So uh, my father did. He had married um, Jenny Palmer, and uh, so the name changed from Palmer to Messer. And my father farmed this up until into the 60s when a lot of farms went out in Vermont with the uh, conversion from uh, milk cans to bulk milk and having to um, uh, have the cattle on cement rather than wood meant that the cows had to be moved from upstairs downstairs. It was too much for a lot of farmers in Vermont. So a lot of farms closed up sold out in the uh, mid-60s, early 70s, and my father sold the farm here. And I bought the farm from him in 72 and been here since. Never farmed, play farmed a little bit, but um, my occupation, I worked for Mad River Glen for 10 years and then I went full time with the Vermont Army National Guard and that was my vocation throughout my career. So I have it set up now so that my daughter, Melissa, will have this farm when I check out of the net. So she'll be obviously the eighth generation and the ninth generation just turned 13 here the other day and I'm hoping that that'll be continued here a while longer.